positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask and, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's at drive time, 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's nine o'clock on television, on radio and online. In the United Kingdom and across the world, this is Mark Dolan tonight. And these are the latest pictures in Gaza. Civilians have been given 24 hours to evacuate the north part of the territory. That's over a million people. Hamas, the terror organisation that control Gaza, have told citizens to actually ignore that instruction. Now, if anything develops, we'll bring it to you here live on GB News. It is a developing story. But elsewhere, in the big story, with schools being forced to close and a strong police presence on the streets of the UK, are Jewish people still safe in Britain? In my take at 10, the BBC, the Premier League and the Football Association are deafening in their silence about the deaths of innocent Israeli civilians. They bring shame on our country. Plus, we'll head live to Israel later in the hour with updates from Tel Aviv. So much to get through. Uh, we will give you every update as it develops. But first, let's head over to the newsroom and Aaron Armstrong. Thanks, Mark. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB News. And well, as you've been hearing, Israel's Prime Minister has delivered a stark warning to Palestinians. Their week-long retaliation against Hamas is just the beginning. Thousands of people are fleeing northern Gaza after the Israeli army ordered more than a million residents to move south by the end of the day for their own safety. Israel says its infantry has already carried out localised raids in Gaza in an effort to locate Hamas rocket sites and hostages. Uh, the UN has described the evacuation order as horrendous and impossible to comply with without devastating humanitarian consequences. Gaza remains under siege. Fuel, food and water is running out. And Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to destroy Hamas, uh, but didn't elaborate on what might follow or how long it would take. We are striking at our enemies with unprecedented might. I emphasize, this is just the beginning. Our enemies have only begun paying the price, and I won't detail what is yet to come. But I tell you that this is only the beginning. Well, the US President Joe Biden, meanwhile, has pledged his unequivocal support for Israel once again and says he's spoken to the families of Americans who remain unaccounted for after the Hamas attack last Saturday. I assured them my personal commitment to do everything possible, everything possible to return every missing American to their families. We're working round the clock to secure the release of Americans held by Hamas in close cooperation with Israel and our partners around the region. We're not going to stop till we bring them home. 
A Reuters video journalist has been killed while working in southern Lebanon. A quick warning, some viewers may find the footage distressing. Well, Issam Abdallah was part of a team based in Alma al Shab, that's near the Israeli border. He was providing a live signal. Reuters say they're working with authorities and supporting his family and colleagues. Uh, two other Reuters journalists were injured. The President of the European Commission was forced to evacuate to a bomb shelter earlier after she arrived in Israel. <laughs> Ursula von der Leyen was meeting the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, when sirens were heard warning of a possible attack. Earlier, she and the president of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, visited the visit village of Kafar Azar in a show of solidarity with the Israeli people. It was among a number of communities overrun by Hamas terrorists on Saturday when more than 1,300 people were killed. France has raised its security alert to the highest level possible following the death of a teacher in a knife attack. It happened at a high school in the northern city of Arras. Two other people were also injured. A suspect's been arrested. A police say he is a Russian-born Chechen and a former student of the high school. President Macron has called the incident a result of barbaric Islamist terrorism. This is GB News across the UK, on digital radio, on TV and on your smart speaker too. That's it for the moment. Now back to Mark. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. These are the latest pictures in Gaza. Civilians have been given 24 hours to evacuate the north part of the territory. That is over 1.1 million people. Civilians are fleeing northern Gaza by car, on the back of trucks and on foot after an Israeli warning that civilians should move south. So a very busy show. We're going to give you wall-to-wall -wall coverage of what's happening, what's playing out in the Middle East. In the big story, with schools being forced to close and a strong police presence on the streets of the UK, are Jewish people still safe in Britain? In my take, attend the BBC, the Premier League and the Football Association are deafening in their silence about the deaths of innocent Israeli civilians. They bring shame on our country. Also later in the show, on other matters, following the outrageous debanking scandal, GB News star Nigel Farage has finally been offered an account by Lloyds. Is this a victory for free speech and the beginning of the end of cancel culture? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker. Plus, tomorrow's front page is likely to be dominated by Israel. That's at 10.30 with my three top pundits tonight, Stephanie Tetchy, Laura Dodsworth and Jerry Hayes. And tonight I'll be asking the pundits, has the behaviour of Captain Tom Moore's family destroyed public trust in charities? And as a top politician defects from the SNP to the Tories, is it a betrayal of voters to change party mid-term? Plus, the most important part of the show, your emails, they come straight to my laptop, mark at gbnews.com. But let me bring you up to speed on exactly what's happening in the Middle East. So it all started on Saturday the 7th of October. The Palestinian terror group Hamas launched an unprecedented attack on Israel. With Hamas terrorists entering communities near the Gaza Strip, killing at least 1,300 people and taking scores of hostages. Meanwhile, more than 1,400 people have been killed in Gaza since Israel launched retaliatory airstrikes and a ground offensive. Israel has told everyone in the north of the Gaza Strip, as I mentioned, this is about 1.1 million people, to relocate to the south of the territory within 24 hours. Well, that deadline ended six minutes ago at 9 p.m. UK time. And so what uh, Israel have said, they want everyone in the Gaza to actually head south of a watercourse known as Wadi Gaza. The UN has said this is not possible and asked Israel to withdraw the order, warning of devastating humanitarian consequences. The World Health Organization said Gaza's health authorities had told it that it would be impossible to evacuate vulnerable hospital patients. Hamas, which controls the Gaza Strip, told civilians to ignore the evacuation order 
from Israel, describing it as fake propaganda. However, many people have been leaving by foot, on bicycles, on cars. There you can see those images playing out. Northern Gaza, containing Gaza City and two refugee camps, is one of the most densely populated parts of the territory. There's only one main road going south and fuel for vehicles is now running out. Hamas's military wing, the al Qassam Brigades, is continuing to fire rockets into Israel, claiming to have targeted Ashkelon in the south of the country with 150 rockets. Israel's stated goal now, as a result of what happened last weekend, is to destroy Hamas. It has massed tens of thousands of soldiers on its borders with Gaza, along with tanks and artillery. It has activated some 300,000 reservists alongside its standing force of 160,000 troops. The Israeli military has prepared for an offensive by dropping 6,000 bombs on Gaza, targeting Hamas commanders and their control centers. One of its main targets is Hamas's vast labyrinth of underground tunnels, which link together its underground command posts. So Gaza, also referred to as Gaza City, is a Palestinian city in the Gaza Strip. It's got a population of over 600,000 people, making it the largest city in the, sta the state of uh, Palestine. The Gaza Strip is a 41 kilometre long and 10 kilometre wide territory located between Israel, Egypt and the Mediterranean Sea. So who are Hamas? Well, they are a Palestinian terror group who have ruled the Gaza Strip since 2007. The group is sworn to Israel's destruction and want to replace it with an Islamic state. Hamas has fought several wars with Israel since it took power. It has fired or allowed other terror groups to fire thousands of rockets at Israel and carried out other deadly attacks. Now, in response, Israel has repeatedly attacked Hamas with airstrikes and sent troops into Gaza during two of the wars. Together with Egypt, it has blockaded the Gaza Strip since 2007 for what it describes as security reasons. Hamas, or in some cases its military wing, the aforementioned uh, Izzedine al qassam brigades, has been designated a terror group by Israel, the United States, the European Union and the UK, as well as other powers. Iran backs the group, providing it with funding, weapons and training. After Hamas's attack, Israel announced a siege of Gaza, cutting its supplies of electricity, fuel, goods and water. It says the siege will not end until Israeli hostages are released. One of the hostages in question is a Holocaust survivor. Maine's electricity has gone out after Gaza's single power station ran out of fuel. Without electricity, Gaza's water and sewage systems are expected to shut down. Households, hospitals and businesses in Gaza are relying on generators now if they have the fuel to run them. The border between Israel and Gaza remains closed. The Rafah crossing, which is controlled by Egypt, has been targeted by Israeli airstrikes and has been largely closed or very heavily restricted. So you'll be aware that this is a developing situation. And of course, Aaron Armstrong will come in with any breaking news as and when we get it. But that deadline for those in northern Gaza to escape has passed. 11 minutes ago, 9 o'clock is when the Israelis said uh, that that area of Gaza needed to be clear. That's over a million residents. They've been running by foot, on cars, all the rest of it. So we are expecting developments. And of course, we're expecting Israel to reply with considerable force, as you've heard there from their Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. So now let's get reaction from my top pundits this evening. Reporter and broadcaster Stephanie Tetchy. Author and journalist Laura Dodsworth and criminal barrister and former Conservative MP Jerry Hayes. Laura, if I can start with you, uh, there really are just no words to describe what's happening in the Middle East. It's deeply worrying, it's deeply tragic, and the most appalling crimes have been committed in the last seven days. It's hard to know where to even start. It's been a devastating week, which started with shocking acts of barbarism, um, Probably one of the most difficult things, I think, this week actually has been the reaction to the barbarism. 
Um, you know, we've had the BBC refusing to call Hamas terrorists. Uh, as you said earlier, the FA won't light up its arches in the colours of blue and white. And it seems that various esteemed professors in the UK and the West are almost proud that decolonisation isn't a metaphor. They're, they're, there's this kind of casual reaction to the atrocity and what really is a blood-soaked pogrom. So that's how the week has started. And then I think a lot of us feel like we're on, you know, we're on tenthooks. What's going to happen next? How much worse? How much worse can the violence escalate? And how many more innocent civilians' lives will be lost? Indeed. And Stephanie, uh, this awful conflict has reflected severe, uh, severe uh, divisions within our own society. And people have been out there in our cities, Manchester, London and elsewhere, waving Palestinian flags. Yeah, it's it's been one of these things where I think, well, usually when these cases of war happens, it always tends to be ignorance, it's been bliss. But this feels much closer to home and it's been the whole week, it's just been so sad to see the division it's caused within the UK from the time that people cannot even send their children to school. I have both friends who are both Jewish and both people who have close allies with Palestine. And just to hear both sides of their story, it's quite heartbreaking and it goes to show that we're all involved in this it's not just something that's happening in the Middle East we all have to wake up and pay attention to the atrocities which has been happening on both sides of this war the only thing that I think would make me feel settled is if I knew that peace was around the corner and clearly this is just the beginning of something horrifying and something which may last a very long time Indeed. So, whilst Stephanie was talking, if you're watching on television, you'll have seen pictures there live from New York of a pro-Palestinian demonstration in front of the UN building in New York City. Uh, Jerry Hayes, peace in the Middle East feels further away than ever. Well, that's exactly what Iran wants. Because don't forget, Israel has done peace deals uh, with Jordan. They've done peace deals with Egypt. They were doing a free trade deal with Bahrain. But the most important one of all, they were doing a deal with Saudi Arabia. There is no way uh, that um, Hamas, who are funded by, um, by Iran... And don't forget, Hamas is not just... They don't want the state of Israel to exist. They want to destroy it and they want to kill every single Jew, man, women or child. If I can just go back to something that Stephanie said uh, and, that was, and something you said in your monologue too. Uh, in the monologue you said, are Jewish people still safe? Mm. Fact of the matter is they haven't been safe in this country for a long time. People don't realise that every single Jewish school well before this conflict has had security people outside. Every synagogue has had security outside. So there are serious, serious problems for the safety of Jewish people in this country, which I find in 2023 utterly appalling. Indeed so. Well, coming up next in the big story, with schools being forced to close and a strong police presence on the streets of the UK, are Jewish people still safe in Britain, or were they ever, as Jerry has rightly asked her? Uh, we'll be discussing that next. Who is it? We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday, the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel.
People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Well, a big response on email to what's happening in Israel and Gaza. Uh, David has said, good evening, Mark. What we're witnessing is very sad, and any killings of civilians, regardless of which side it may come from, is wrong. However, it's a reflection of humanity that we have lost our basic human dignity of care and empathy for each other. Sadly, religious causes and political causes have been put above human life all over the world led by divisive politics across the world, looking to cause division among all of us, Muslim, Christian, Catholic, Sikh, and any other religious viewpoint across the world should not be put before the basic fact that we are all human. We have the worst leaders in living history, says Dave. Uh, David, thank you very much for that. Keep those emails coming. And we can go now to live pictures of Gaza where that deadline for residents to head south has passed. This was a diktat from the Israeli government telling all residents of North Gaza to head south of the region by 9 o'clock UK time, which was 20 minutes ago. So that deadline has passed. Civilians are fleeing northern Gaza, which is what we've got a shot of at the moment. They're fleeing by car, on the back of trucks and on foot after that warning from Israel that civilians should move south. That's 1.1 million people living in northern areas told to head out as quickly as possible. Many thousands have done just that. OK, we also have a view of New York City live in front of the UN building and pro-Palestinian demonstrators. Now, six Jewish schools in London are closed today amid fears for pupils' safety following a surge in anti-Semitic attacks. As the Home Secretary Suella Bravman warned, medieval anti-Semitism by Hamas was no excuse to target Jews in Britain. The Community Security Trust, a charity that supports British Jewish people, said anti-Semitic hate crimes had tripled in the four days after Hamas terrorists attacked Israel. So is Britain still safe for Jewish people? Let's speak to Isaac Zafati, who is the executive director of Stand With Us UK. Isaac, thank you very much for joining us. Are you able to answer that question? Is Britain still safe for Jewish people today? Thank you for having me, Mark. Uh, look, I think that today was a pivotal day. Uh, the fact that uh, six schools were closed, I was in a conference yesterday with Jewish uh, students and young professionals, and they asked me for my professional advice if they can go to work tomorrow. I think that this situation is unbearable. 
Uh, I would like to remind you and the viewers that we are not in Europe of 1923. We are in Britain of 2023. And I think that uh, today was, again, as a pivotal day. And I think that that reality must change dramatically. Indeed. Uh, do you think that school closures will continue into next week and also other uh, Jewish properties? I honestly don't know. And I think, you know, Mark, this is the technicality. Uh, half a year ago, there was a rally in central London. There were thousands of people there. We have this video, and I think that it was all over the media. And uh, speaker after speaker, uh, they called to the destruction and the annihilation of the Jewish state. And the crowd was applauding. And by the way, this rally was secured by the London police. So it means it got the legitimacy to do that. I think that uh, those kind of actions are red flags to the, Jew to the British society, not only to the Jewish community. And only from the past few days, we got like a video from Manchester University in which the head of the Palestinian society stands behind her, again, hundreds of students, and she basically uh, telling to the camera the joy and satisfaction, quote, that they feel due to the massacre, obviously she didn't uh, define it as a massacre, uh, in, in Israel. Uh, I hold another print screen of correspondence between uh, uh, um, students in King's College laughing that 40 babies were killed. I, I have those print screens. And I think that basically, you know, universities, schools, these are the production line of the next generation of the UK. This is not only an issue for the Jewish people. This is something that should concern any decent British people for the future. And as I said, I think that this time uh, we cannot settle in uh, ceremonies, in grief, and in statement. We need to see deeds and we need to see legislation that basically change this reality from the core basis. Isaac, is there a difference between those supporting Palestine and waving the Palestinian flag in London, Manchester and elsewhere, New York tonight? Is there a difference between them and those supporting Hamas? So I would judge it according to the content and not, and not according to symbol. Uh, I, I appreciate that there are people who want to protest for a Palestinian state. It's their democratic right. They can do it. I think is that the red line uh, uh, is where you are inciting to violence. And when you call to a destruction of a country or a state, no matter what country, whether it's Israel, Ukraine, or Sweden, if you like, I think that that is something that should not be part of the uh, proper discourse in the public sphere. And that's how I judge, I judge it. I judge it according to, con according to content. Now, those people, unfortunately, in universities, who calls to the destruction of the state of Israel. And you know, they have this famous chant, river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Uh, I think that what happened on Saturday is the fulfillment of this slogan. That's what they want to, to, to happen. And th that is very concerned, and that's the way I judge it. Uh, would you like to see those celebrating what Hamas have done in this country being arrested? Uh, look, uh, I don't want to give a uh, suggestion to the police and to the government. Uh, that's not my area of professionalism. But I think that, uh, uh, again, as I said, it's in the interest of the British society and the, the British government to remove those kind of tax from the public sphere. And they will choose uh, what kind of steps they want to take in order to do that. Legislation, enforcement. I think that the fact that uh, the majority of the Jewish community thought twice today if to leave their home. And again, it happens in the UK, a glorious democracy. That is a significant red flag to the society. And we cannot treat this day as if it's another day of tension. And tomorrow, this wave will be go away. Writing in The Telegraph today, uh, their columnist, Madeleine Grant, said that if Britain is no longer safe for Jewish people, then Britain is finished. Would you agree? I absolutely agree, because I think that what will happen to the Jewish community will continue to happen or might happen eventually uh, to other minorities. And that is a huge concern. And that's why I'm, I think that, again, it's, 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 an, it's an issue for the, Jewish, for the British society and not only for the Jewish community. Yes. I mean, can you tell us about what some of your family members or, or friends are going through at the moment? 
uh, under this heightened tension here in the UK. Uh, have you got family members or friends who are afraid to go out? Yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm, as you can tell from my uh, British accent, I'm an Israeli. And I am uh, a member in many uh, uh, Israeli groups and also Jewish uh, 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 groups. And, you know, I see the discourse. People are asking and, and advising each other, should I send my kid to school tomorrow? Should I go to work? What should I do? What, what kind of uh, uh, protection measures do you took? I can show you the text messages that I got from Israel for my family asking me not to leave my house because they heard that it is going to be dangerous here. So I think that the situation that the Jewish people cannot be safe now in their homeland and also cannot be safe <laughs> in Britain and maybe in other Western countries, again, it's, it, it's a warning sign to every decent society. Today is the Jewish people and tomorrow it will be any other minority. And that's something that we should fight against. Isaac Zarfati, thank you so much for joining us, the executive director of Stand With Us UK. Apologies for the uh, change in video quality there, getting the Andy Warhol treatment. But uh, the message from Isaac Zarfati was a very grave one, which is that at the moment, Britain is not safe for Jewish people, with many families afraid to leave the house. Uh, completely outrageous in a modern and free democratic society. Uh, coming up with the pundits next, has the behaviour of Captain Tom Moore's family destroyed public trust in charities? And also, as a top politician defects from the SNP to the Tories, is it a betrayal of voters to change party? Don't forget, at 10 o'clock in my take at 10, I'll be dealing with the BBC, the FA and the Premier League, who I believe have completely misread the situation in Israel. Lots to come. The pundits are next. See you in two. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to ordinary people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us at 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Well, so many emails coming in about what's happening in the Middle East. Kathy says, hi, Mark. Uh, people should remember that not all Jews support the Israeli government and not all supporters of the Palestinians support Hamas. That anyone should celebrate the death of a fellow human being is just so sad. Uh, Kathy, thank you for that. Ian says, uh, Mark, Paris police have been using tear gas and water cannons to disperse dangerous crowds. Surely it's time that our police did the same. Uh, Della says, hi, Mark, the fact that Jewish schools require protection now and security all year round tells you all you need to know about these anti-Semitic animals that we have allowed into our country. The British Jewish community has every right to go about their daily lives safely and we must end this hatred against them. Um, let's have a look. Pat says, uh, hi, Mark. My understanding is that government funding has been made available for Islamic places of worship since 2016. So it's not just Jewish institutions that are under threat. There is a big difference between being anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist. And last but not least for now, uh, David says, uh, good evening, Mark. My father and hundreds of thousands of British men and women gave six years of their lives fighting against the scourge of the Nazis and their death cult to free this world from fascism and secure the safety and well-being of the Jewish nation. The Allies prevailed against the Axis. The New World included a homeland for the Jews and the safety of the Jewish people. Israel was hard fought for by Americans, British, French and all nations of the free world. If you do not subscribe to this British value, then you denigrate the sacrifice of my father's generation. It is absolutely untenable that Jews cannot walk the streets of Britain in safety. BBC, hang your head. FA, no words, says David. Uh, well, look, I'll be dealing with the BBC and the FA and the Premier League at 10 o'clock in my take at 10. I think they have massively let the country down and they have let Jewish people down. I'll be dealing with that at 10. You won't want to miss it. Let's now take a look at live pictures from Gaza. And at the moment, a dark sky. But that deadline of nine o'clock has passed, by which time the Israelis have advised people in Gaza to head south. It's a population of 1.1 million people in the north and they've been leaving on trucks and in cars and by foot. Plenty still there. And at the moment, the night sky very still, but perhaps not for long. OK, well, we'll come back to this story very shortly, but reacting to the other stories of the day, my wonderful pundits this evening, reporter and broadcaster Stephanie Tetchy, author and journalist Laura Dodsworth, and criminal barrister and former Conservative MP, though he likes to keep that bit quiet. Mm -hmm. oh. Jerry Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> now, the daughter of Captain Sir Tom Moore has admitted her family kept profits from three books that he'd written reported by The Sun to be £800,000. Hannah Ingram Moore told Talk TV's Piers Morgan that her father wanted to get the profits uh, from the book sales and give them straight to the family. Sir Tom, who died in February 2021, became famous when he raised £38 million for NHS charities during the first COVID lockdown. He did that by walking 100 laps of his garden before his 100th birthday. Whilst his legacy of raising millions of pounds for NHS charities is not in doubt, controversies around the charity have endured. They began as the charity's watchdog, the Charity Commission, announced its investigation into the Captain Tom Foundation after concerns were raised over its accounts and governance. The investigation came after the charity paid more than £50,000 to companies run by Mrs Ingram Moore and her husband. Captain Tong Moore's daughter told Morgan last night that she wishes she'd never taken the £85,000 annual salary to run her father's foundation. And she defended the construction of a luxury spa in his name, which she built on her own property and which the local authority have told her to demolish. Now, there's no evidence of wrongdoing here, but has the negative publicity around Captain Tom Moore's family destroyed public trust in charities? Stephanie. I don't think so. I think people in general are quite sceptical when they are giving money to charities. They like to do it because they want to feel like they're donating to a good cause. But I think with most charities, there's always this lack of transparency of where every single pound is going mm. to. At the end of the day, so Tom Moore's work will always be there. His legacy will remain. His children, even though she did say that's where his wish is, unfortunately, he's died, so he can't back 
those claims. But I think, in, in general, I think people always have this little element of doubt when they are donating to charities. Yeah, Laura, what do you think about this? I mean, it's, it's not a good look, is it, for the legacy of Tom Moore? No, I mean, I, I, I agree with a lot of what you just said, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say that his legacy does survive this intact because, unfortunately, there's a tarnish now. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, whether the family have just managed things in a very ham-fisted way because they're not experienced with the charity, yeah. or whether it's a bit grubby and greedy, mm -hmm. it, it, it does tarnish his really fantastic legacy. You know, he was a, mm. a war hero and... Um, so that's a pity. In terms of whether this changes our attitudes towards charity... Um, I do prefer to give to smaller charities when I'm more confident that the money will make an impact. But what really made me feel like that isn't, isn't Sir Captain Tom Moore's foundation, it's, it's Oxfam. Do you remember Oxfam in, in Haiti? Oh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not even going to say it because it's so, so revolting. Um, and then that, that lovely... But sexual abuse, yeah, yeah essentially, in communities. Yeah. Okay, sexual assault. And not and just using, Oxfam, a using, lot of other charities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, and, yeah. And Allegations using, around save the children. prostitutes yeah. and maybe underage vulnerable women and girls from refugee camps. Just revolting. Um, and then, of course, this year they were... Um, they, they released that really unpleasant video about transphobia that included an image of J.K. Rowling. They denied it was J.K. Rowling, but everyone knew it was. Yeah. So I, I, think, I think the tarnish has come off charities for quite a while, unfortunately. Mm. Indeed, and you do wonder where your money is going, as you said, because if it's a big charity, they often have large mm -hmm. central London HQs, which mm -hmm. people don't really want to be paying for, do they? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. or spa pools in the garden. Well, exactly mm. right. What's your overview of this particular case? Do, think do you think... So. Is there a case to answer here? Yeah, it's a load of old rubbish. It's just typical media. And I'm not one of these people who blame the media for everything. Uh, the the, the, the Ingram Moors, just by their name, are achingly middle class. Mm. And people just think, oh, dear, look at these people. They're, they're grubby. She was earning £85,000 a year. Yeah, he raised £38 million. Mm. She and it got cost through. about that to run a charity. Exactly. And then he got uh, a £600,000 uh, for a book he wrote. OK, big deal. He said that was for them, for the family. They were looking after him for years. Oh, let's grow up about this. I think, However, it was actually... I think the, the figure quoted by The Sun is 800,000. Oh, 800, you're quite almost right. Almost a million pounds. Would that money have been accrued if it wasn't for the perception of Captain Tom Moore as a charitable figure? You've just said it. Perception. This is the perception of the press. The reason we are talking about it now is because it's been in the press, because they've said, look, these Ingram Moors, oh, we can't prove anything, of course. We're not suggesting for one moment that they're dishonest, but it feels... Tainted. Mm. Well, that's a load of old rubbish, and they should be very careful indeed. Oh, what do you think about the charity sector in this country? Do you think it's bloated? Do you think it's wasteful? I don't know, to be honest. Um, you, you're quite right. We're talking about Oxfam and some of the things that. Do you think there on. should be more? Uh, you know, you've got the charity support. commission. You've got yeah, the charity the commission. Yes, of course there should be transparency, but it's meant to be transparency. But lots and lots and lots of people in this country are giving. Really giving because they believe. I don't like the, mm. the chugs in the street so much, but they genuinely believe. I give to, 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 to a number of charities and I, I hope my money is going for those causes that I care about. But don't let's, don't let's just say, has the charity sector been tainted because of this? It hasn't. But do you think charities are overplaying their hand now? I mean, you get sort of door-to-door -door visits, don't you, which I think is unacceptable ah, to be ringing the doorbell. Yes. You've got chuggers yeah. in the street with the clipboard yes. wanting yeah. your direct debit. And then you've also got, uh, you've got sort of other aspects, like if you go, for example, to the supermarket, okay. you're sometimes asked to offer a voluntary donation yes. when, you, when you pay on the cash machine. There are a lot of scammers in the name of charity, and I think we're quite modern these days, and I think maybe charities do need to update their strategies and they do need to develop how they are communicating with their donations. Well, are they too pushy? Is it, is it pushy when you are when you go to Tesco and they want an extra 25p? I think it is a bit too pushy then. Well, it's... And it's more than pushy, actually. It's confusing. Because when you're putting change into a bucket next to the mm -hmm. till, you make a very deliberate, conscious choice to do it. Yes. These buttons on the till are really confusing. Mm -hmm. And I find myself like, which one is yes, which one is no? It's like the online choice architecture you get on websites. You're always being tricked into... Like, you, th you think you've declined all the cookies, you go through this long form, <laughs> and then you realise you've accepted them all. And that's what these charity forms at the till are a bit like as well. Well, worse than that, and I think this is the big story, the pushiness of charities. Now, my wife, um, you know, donates to numb charities. I thought you'd say she was pushy. Yeah. You'll be sleeping on your own tonight. 
national look, TV. Don't, 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 You've just, just been cancelled. Don't, 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 don't be cancelled. But you do get people ringing up and saying, oh, you're paying £3 a month for this. Oh, why didn't you put it up to five? Uh, why didn't you do this? And, and, and there is this perpetual push. And that is wrong. That, that is the scandal. That's what's tainting charities. Uh, briefly, mm. Laura, your brilliant book, a State of Fear is all about behavioural psychology during the pandemic. Um, there's a bit of nudging going on with these charity donations, isn't there? Because I was in a cosmetics shop a few weeks ago and I just bought some hand cream and they said, they said to me, would you like to make a donation to charity? Now, at that point, you're sort of shamed into saying yes, aren't you? And I yeah. think that's a step too far. I, I think so. Um, You've got a queue of people behind my, you going, did you see that bloke at the front? He said well, no to giving to yeah, charity. But, but you spotted it there. And actually, my next book, Free Your Mind, is more about how you identify and resist these things. It's like, it's like the button I'm talking about. If something is a default, you're much more likely to do it. So when the default is you round up, or if somebody says, will you, in front of other people, obviously that's going to appeal to your ego and you don't want to be shamed mm. by saying no. And, um, you know, the Competition and Markets Authority is actually investigating these sorts of buttons because they are unfair. Um, I don't think they're looking so much in terms of the charitable sector, mm. but the way that people are um, guided into decisions that might not be optimum for them. Mm. Yeah, too right. Interesting stuff. We'll look at lots more to come in my take at 10. The BBC, the Premier League and the Football Association are deafening in their silence about the deaths of innocent Israeli civilians. They bring shame on our country. But first, we'll head back to Tel Aviv uh, in Israel and get the latest on what's happening uh, in the Middle East. Don't go anywhere. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK. Here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Well, at take, uh, in the take at 10 at 10 o'clock, I will be dealing with the BBC and the FA and the Premier League, who have been definitely silent when it comes to the suffering of Israelis. But let's get more now on developments in the Middle East, where retaliatory action by Israel in Gaza against the terror group Hamas was expected to begin at 9 o'clock UK time. Uh, live from Tel Aviv, we're now joined by journalists India Naftali and Emily Schrader. And I spoke to both of you on Saturday, last Saturday, of course, uh, when this awful story began. And uh, India, last time we spoke, we were joined by your partner, Hananya, who I understand has now been called up by the Israeli military. That's right. He's often... Oh, it was an incredibly difficult moment for us. We are newlyweds. We were just married this year. So, you know, as newlyweds, I never expected that our first year apart, so that's my husband of just uh, eight months would be drafted and sent away from me. But you know, one thing he told me before he left, he hugged me and he said, India, I am not just going to defend my country. I'm going to defend my family and my home. Because the first thing the Hamas terrorists did when they came and infiltrated Israel was to slaughter and massacre families. So what was his mood when he left? It sounds like it was defiant. He felt such a sense of duty. Mm. I knew that, you know, on one hand, you would think that when someone is called to duty, that they don't want to go, that, wow, I'm scared, I'm afraid. But he, he it's almost as if he, he wanted to go. He, he went with such honor and just dignity and, and just wanting to serve the country. And we can see that through so many Israelis. There's even people volunteering to come and serve right now. There's people uh, taking emergency flights back If they're not being called by the uh, home front command, they're coming back by choice. Yeah, do you know in what capacity Hananya will be serving in the military? So Hananya serves in a tank division. So he will likely, I am not certain where he is right now or what he's doing, but he is in a tank division. And he was back in 2014 when he was active duty, he was actually inside the tank loading artillery. So that is likely what he is uh, working on right now. Emily, the last time we spoke, the mood in Israel was one of abject terror, uh, misery, upset and fear. Uh, how are things tonight? Well, I wouldn't say the mood has changed that much. Looking at the recent events as the numbers have been counted for casualties, for injuries, it does seem to be more grim, even if more secure, than what we initially feared. Uh, there are over just over 1,400 that have been confirmed dead, over 3,200 injured. We haven't had any word on the hostages. And I think yesterday was probably one of the most difficult days for Israelis as we started to hear the absolute absolute horror stories of what happened on Saturday from firsthand accounts. There were children who were tortured, who were tied together and burned alive. Uh, there were babies that were executed. The IDF reported that they found approximately 40 babies who had been killed, some of them burned alive, some of them even decapitated, as well as other casualties which were decapitated. Uh, we have continued to see rocket fire very heavily throughout the South. And in addition to that, we have seen several times coming from the North, including today, which we saw Gaza fire rockets that actually reached the North. So it does seem that things are escalating. However, at the same time, uh, we do see that the IDF is taking a significant action against Hamas terror groups. We saw today that the IDF dropped leaflets to warn almost 1 million Gazans to leave northern Gaza and enter southern Gaza. Now, Israel's goal with this is in order to protect as many civilian lives as possible. Of course, this is incredibly difficult when you're dealing with a terrorist organization, of course, with the backing of the Islamic Republic of Iran, that continues to target civilians themselves. 
themselves, including, by the way, their own civilians. Hamas is known for using human shields throughout Gaza. They often plant their military sites, weapons caches, infrastructure, other activities they will conduct in the middle of civilian populations. I'm talking about residential neighborhoods, mosques, schools. In fact, multiple times in 2014, we saw that uh, Hamas had stored rockets inside UNRWA schools, children's schools, three times in one operation. So we know how they work. Uh, they're committing war crimes left, right, and sideways, and that makes it incredibly difficult for Israel to take action. At the same time, we can't apologize for taking action. In fact, the opposite. Israel has to take out Hamas. We have to. This has gone on long enough. It's only getting worse from here. And when it gets worse for us, it's also getting worse for Palestinians. Don't forget that. And do the Israeli people have confidence in the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? I mean, I think that there is serious doubt right now. The country is not nearly as politically divided as it was even prior to this operation in which you saw a stark divide between being supportive of this government or opposing it. That is not the conversation happening right now, nor should it be. Uh, it's not the time to discuss whether the prime minister is fit or unfit. That being said, initial polling did indicate that the vast majority of the public does feel that the prime minister after this should step down, remains to be seen how Israelis will feel at the end of this uh, operation. Uh, well, what about the potential humanitarian impact of an Israeli retaliation? I mean, it's my personal view that, that uh, Israel has a right to defend itself, and that is the position of the UK government. But uh, is it weighing on people's minds in Tel Aviv, the impact this will have in Gaza? Oh, absolutely. I mean, for me personally, I think it's absolutely heartbreaking to see some of the scenes from Gaza. And what's even more frustrating is that it doesn't have to be that way. It is that way because we're dealing with a terrorist organization that is determined to kill as many civilians as possible. And by the way, that goes for Palestinians too. They're not interested in protecting Palestinian lives. And the reason that Israel dropped those leaflets today is precisely to protect and to minimize civilian casualties. And we've seen that same behavior from the IDF in every single operation that they conduct in Gaza. Israel does everything that they can in order to preserve civilian lives and not to have more uh, casualties than absolutely necessary. At the same time, we have seen a push from civil society yesterday and today, as well as some calls from the IDF on this issue urging the UN to take action. But we have seen public pressure to encourage Egypt and the Arab League, as well as the Arab world in general, to take action for the Palestinians Palestinians to help provide them support or safe passage through the Rafah crossing through Egypt. Uh, however, Egypt has rejected those calls thus far, and Hamas has in fact tried to block Palestinians from leaving the northern Gaza Strip, including by, according to reports from Gaza, by blocking some of the roads. Uh, India, uh, finally coming back to you, your husband uh, Hanyana has just been called up to the Israeli military forces, if anyone's just joining us. Um, are you hoping to be in touch with him? Do you have a way of communicating with him? Well, thank God I get the occasional text to calm my nerves. I mean, I think anyone who has a deployed spouse right now is just waiting for that next text just to yeah. confirm that we can go to bed knowing that they're okay. Indeed. Uh, well, my heart goes out to you, India, and I wish you well. My thanks to India Naftali and Emily Schrader. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, obviously a very, very tough situation in Tel Aviv. Thank you for joining us. Uh, more to come. Uh, a very busy 10 o'clock hour. We've got the papers hot off the press. And in my take at 10, the BBC, the Premier League and the Football Association have completely misread the situation. The FA and the Premier League have been deafening in their silence about the deaths of innocent Israeli civilians. They've talked about conflict on both sides, an escalating situation. Why can't you say we stand by Israel and Israel's right to defend herself? They bring shame on our country. That is my take at 10. And what about the BBC, who cannot bring themselves to use the word terrorist? It's not a word I'm afraid of. If you know even 1% of what happened, on the 7th of October, last Saturday, you would agree that these were acts of terror. So the BBC, the FA and the Premier League will be dealt with in just a few minutes. Uh, see you very shortly.
it. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday, the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's exactly 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. Now, civilians are fleeing northern Gaza by car, on the back of trucks and on foot after an Israeli warning that civilians should move south. About 1.1 million people living in northern areas have been told to leave ahead of an expected ground offensive by Israeli forces, plus possible airstrikes as well. Now, that deadline to flee the north expired an hour ago at 9 o'clock UK time. And that is a live picture of Gaza City. That is the skyline. And uh, we are expecting that skyline to light up uh, with rockets in the hours to come because the Israeli government, the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, has said that he will respond to the terror attacks which began on Saturday the 7th of October with full force. Uh, Israel's military objective is to wipe out Hamas. These are live pictures from New York City in the United States. And this is a pro-Palestine demonstration in the Big Apple in front of the UN building. So emotions running high across the world, not just in the Middle East, but across the West as well. Speaking of emotions... In my take at 10, the BBC, the Premier League and the Football Association are deafening in their silence about the deaths of innocent Israeli civilians. They bring shame on our country. In particular, the Premier League and the FA have a case to answer. They have completely misread the situation and let down Jewish people in this country. 
In other news, following the outrageous debanking scandal, GB News star Nigel Farage, the ultimate survivor, has been offered an account by Lloyds. Is this the beginning of the end of cancel culture? Is it a victory for free speech? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker. Plus tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from my top pundits tonight. So a packed show. Lots to get through. My take at 10 in just a moment. The BBC, Gary Lineker, the Premier League and the FA. Outrageous double standards. First, the news with Aaron Armstrong. Very good evening to you. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has vowed to eradicate Hamas and says their week-long counter-offensive is just the beginning. Thousands of people are fleeing northern Gaza after the Israeli army ordered more than a million residents to move south by the end of the day for their own safety. Now, the deadline to leave the enclave passed at 9 o'clock UK time. The Israeli army has carried out its first ground raids in Gaza in an effort to locate Hamas terrorists and hostages. The United Nations has described the evacuation order as horrendous and likely to have devastating humanitarian consequences. Gaza remains under siege, with fuel, food and water running out. Almost 1,900 people have been killed there, including 614 children. And Mr Netanyahu has vowed to destroy Hamas, but didn't elaborate on what might follow. We are striking at our enemies with unprecedented might. I emphasise, this is just the beginning. Our enemies have only begun paying the price, and I won't detail what is yet to come. But I tell you that this is only the beginning. President Joe Biden's also been speaking in the last couple of hours. He says urgently addressing the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is a priority for the United States. He's also spoken to the families of Americans who remain unaccounted for since Hamas attacked Israel last Saturday. I assured them my personal commitment to do everything possible everything possible to return every missing American to their families. We're working round the clock to secure the release of Americans held by Hamas in close cooperation with Israel and our partners around the region. We're not going to stop till we bring them home. The president of the European Commission was forced to evacuate to a shelter shortly after arriving in Israel this afternoon. Ursula von der Leyen's meeting with the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, was interrupted by air raid sirens. Earlier, she and the president of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, visited the village of Kafar Azar in a show of solidarity with the Israeli people. It was a, among a number of communities overrun by Hamas terrorists on Saturday when more than 1,300 people were killed. A Reuters video journalist has been killed while working in southern Lebanon, a warning that some viewers may find the footage distressing. <laughs> well, Issam Abdallah was part of a team based in Alma al-Shab, near the Israeli border, providing a live signal. Reuters say they're working with the authorities and indeed supporting Issam's family and colleagues. Uh, two other Reuters journalists were injured. France has raised its security alert to the highest level following the death of a teacher in a knife attack. It happened at a high school in the northern city of Arras. Two other people also sustained injuries. A suspect been arrested. Police say he's a Russian-born Chechen and a former student of the high school. President Macron called the incident a result of barbar barbaric Islamist terrorism. And this is GB News. That is all for the moment. I'll be back with more a little bit later. But now it's over to Mark. Thanks, Aaron. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Following the outrageous debanking scandal, GB News star Nigel Farage has been offered an account, finally, by Lloyds Bank. Is this a victory for free speech and the beginning of the end of cancel culture? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker. Plus tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits, broadcaster Stephanie Tetchy, author Laura Dodsworth and criminal barrister Jerry Hayes. Plus, they'll be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros. A packed hour to come, of course, all of the latest from Gaza 
and Israel. That deadline for people in North Gaza to head south has passed an hour and six minutes ago, nine o'clock. We'll bring you the latest as we get it. But first, my take at 10. It takes a crisis for someone to reveal themselves, for better or for worse. The silence following the terror attacks on innocent Israeli citizens from the usual suspect write-on political commentators and celebrities has been deafening. These media types with millions of followers and millions in the bank normally live on platforms like Twitter, signalling their virtue by backing the latest campaign, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ plus rights and Just Stop Oil. But Just Stop Terrorism doesn't seem to feature in their world view. It seems the annihilation of 260 people at a music festival, the kidnapping of a Holocaust survivor, the beheading of babies, the burning of human bodies, and the abject terror of Jewish people living in this country doesn't merit comment, just a disgusting and mealy-mouthed call for a ceasefire on both sides. By equivocating in this manner, household name woke celebrities are picking a side, and it's not the side of the innocent Israelis who were dragged out of their homes, raped, spat at and shot dead by these medieval monsters. This may not be their intention, but the unfortunate perception is that they're literally siding with the terrorists. Thank God I'm on this channel where I can actually use that word, terrorist. Unlikely to be nominees for this week's Read the Room Award, the BBC have dug in their heels, refusing to refer to Hamas as terrorists, even though they are designated as such by the British government. Here is the Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps, who is Jewish, calling out the BBC this morning on the Radio 4 Today programme. The Israelis are trying to get hold of the Hamas terrorists, who you don't seem to be particularly interested in, and the BBC seems to refuse to call terrorists, even though the British Parliament has legislated that they are terrorists, which is a question I haven't heard the BBC answer yet. Have you not seen any of the coverage on the BBC of the atrocities, the dead, the injured, the survivors? Yes, I have. So how can you say that we're not interested in, in those atrocities? Well, I, read, I, I read, I think it was a very unfortunate um, uh, article, I think it was by John Simpson, explaining why, although the British Parliament has legislated a map as a prescribed organisation and a terrorist, the BBC think it's not appropriate to call them terrorists. Are you aware of the Ofcom code and the rules for all broadcasters? Of course. The refusal of the BBC to use the word terrorist in relation to those Hamas monsters is an ongoing insult to Jewish people. I would expect that crank Jeremy Corbyn to take this position. Of course I would. Jeremy Corbyn is the man who called Hamas his friends and who lost the Labour Party whip because of his response to the Equalities and Human Rights Commission in relation to anti-Semitism. But where is Saint Gary Lineker in all this? A man who in the past has invoked memories of the Holocaust, comparing Suella Braverman's efforts to tackle illegal immigration as redolent of 1930s Germany. But no condemnation of actual Nazi behaviour and the worst attack on Jewish people since the Holocaust. Perhaps he was busy washing another bottle of Just For Men charcoal edition into his hair. His only comment on the tragedy playing out in Israel was to retweet and applaud an extraordinarily offensive tweet from the Premier League. Whilst condemning the violence against innocent civilians, there's no mention in the statement that Israel was invaded or that war crimes against Jewish people have been committed. Instead, they hide behind the cloak of snake oil language like escalating crisis, which takes us back to the BBC's narrative of conflict on both sides. Let me correct the BBC and the Premier League and all of these previously woke celebrities who seem to have forgotten their Twitter password. Hamas are a terror organisation who invaded Israel. Israel are defending themselves, which the British government have confirmed they have a right to do. Now, in the past, the Premier League have been absolutely right to call out the evil of racism, particularly the kick racism out of football campaign, which I thought was brilliant. But their obsession with the highly political and divisive Black Lives Matter movement, which calls for the defunding of the police, the end of the nuclear family and a communist economic model, 
demonstrates the selective morality of the woke left. Don't take my word for it, whilst the Premier League took the knee to this corrupt and dangerous organisation, it has revealed its own true colours celebrating Hamas's evil actions. In one particular tweet, an official BLM account in the United States showed a picture, an image, an illustration of a Hamas terrorist on a parachute flying into Israeli territory to kill 260 people at a peace music festival. This is the same BLM to which the Premier League has devoted hundreds of hours of publicity, and now they cannot stand up for Israel. Most egregiously, the Football Association refused to shine the colours of the Israeli flag onto the Arch of Wembley, even though these colours have adorned 10 Downing Streets and many other public buildings in the country. Football has been dripping in woke ideology for years, with rainbow laces, even though they happily participated in the World Cup in Qatar, where it's illegal to be gay. It's a sport which encourages thousands of people to gamble money they haven't got, aggressively markets junk food and alcohol, rinses the fans to pay the players a small fortune, and pretends to be so inclusive and caring, but has double standards which are eye-watering. Amid tragic scenes of horror in Israel, the football authorities have done sweet F.A. Tackling racism seems to involve leaving Jewish people on the bench. The beautiful game just turned ugly. That's my opinion. What's yours? Mark at GBNews.com. I'll get to your emails shortly. Earlier on this evening, GB News' own reporter Joe Casper was at Wembley to get reaction from football fans prior to the England-Australia game. It was a terrorist attack at the end of the day, so even regardless of what's going on between them, because it was a terrorist attack, that's why he's ready for It's a terrible situation in the Middle East, and it has been for decades, but I think they've done right to just avoid the issue. Do neither, because we want to be neutral. Either both flags or no flags. Yes. We support Israel, and I think it's good to show that. I really don't know what's best here. I really don't know what to do for the best in this situation. I think we should uh, show our support, um, but it's only right. Yes, if it's good enough for Downing Street, why is it not good enough for Wembley Stadium? Let me know your thoughts, Mark, at gbnews.com. Let's get the views now of reporter and broadcaster Stephanie Tetchy, author and journalist Laura Dodsworth and criminal barrister and former Conservative MP Jerry Hayes. Uh, Laura, can I start with you? Uh, your reaction to Wembley's decision not to shine uh, the Israeli flag colours onto the famous Wembley Arch. Spineless. And they have no moral compass whatsoever. They lit up their arch in the colours of the Ukraine flag, blue and yellow. Good. Um, also, red, white and blue for when uh, Paris had terror attacks. They'll light up in rainbow colours for pride, but they can't light up in blue and white for the worst terrorist attack since 9-11. It's disgusting. And actually, you know, the last week has been such an eye-opener for me. I've been really ashamed at how some British people have responded. Because while the loss of innocent civilian life on each side is equally tragic. There is no equality in what's happening. You know, this was started by Hamas committing awful, awful, atrocious, barbaric acts of terrorism. You know, you either think that mowing down kids in a festival and kidnapping the literal elderly survivors of the Holocaust and burning and beheading babies and children is terrorism, or you don't. It's pretty simple. And if you do think it's terrorism, then you stand in solidarity with them. Some of those football fans there, I have to say, I think they're a bit confused. And you showed that really awful, heinous cartoon of the paraglider that BLM shared. I mean, they've really shown their colours. Terrible organisation. It's not just them. There were student unions in this country that shared the same kind of cartoon. The sort of people who normally condemn hate speech, whatever that is, won't condemn acts of real hate. Uh, Jerry Hayes, the head of the Israeli Football Association, has condemned the actions of the English FA for not supporting the Israeli people and Jewish people in, in the UK. Your reaction to this? I'm just horrified. I'm not surprised, but just horrified. I'm horrified with the BBC, and I'm one of these people who supports the BBC. I defend the BBC. I don't want them to be funded 
but what is the matter with these people? These guys, as you rightly said, are terrorists. They committed appalling acts of atrocity. We did this for Ukraine, didn't we? We actually put up the colours of Ukraine. People in um, their homes put up the flag of Ukraine. Why shouldn't we just for once say, well, we may not like the state of Israel, I don't particularly like the state of Israel, but don't confuse it with the Jews. Don't confuse it uh, as people are doing and say, well, because Israel has behaved badly in the past, you can do anything. Because what are they saying? Jews don't count. Now, doesn't that have a resonance? Doesn't that have a resonance all through history? And it sends a chill down my spine. Now, the BBC are very clear that they're not using language like terrorism because oh. they want to follow the broadcasting and journalistic yeah. code to which they must adhere. Uh, John Simpson, one of the most experienced journalists in the country, of course, a, a legend, a foreign correspondent for the BBC, has stood by what the BBC have done in not using that emotive language. He said it's terribly important for the credibility of the BBC's journalism not to be seen to take sides. Um, Stephanie, what about the FA then and also the Premier League staying out of politics? Now, that's fine, except that in the past, they've got very involved in politics. Mark, in this situation, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. While I think we should call a spade a spade and what happened if Hamas's attack against Israel is terrorism, what's been frustrating over the past week is people forcing people to pick a side. It's more complex. More people who haven't been aware of what's been happening in the Middle East, especially between Israel and Palestine, people are making themselves more knowledgeable on it. And it's hard to pick a side because you, people are making out if you support Palestine, it means you're supporting the terrorists. That's okay. not the case. People make out if you're su supporting Israel, you're turning a blind eye to all the atrocities which they've done over the past 75 years. OK. It's complex. It's not okay. that and complex, And to be Stephanie. honest, Mark... It's not colours, really. Colours, Jerry, colours, Jerry colours what we'll do... It's uh, not that Stephanie, complex. it's not complex, complex. It's says Jeremy not. And you Jerry, don't... we will pick this up at 10.30 with okay. the papers, so hold that thought. Um, okay. Mark at gbnews.com, what's your view? And next up, why is Nigel Farage celebrating? Find out next. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to ordinary people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching.
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's time now for The Newsmaker, and GB News star Nigel Farage is celebrating victory after being offered a bank account by Lloyds Bank after being sensationally dumped for his political views by Coots. The scandal saw the resignation of the parent company NatWest's chief executive, and the story drew attention to the many thousands of people who have seen their accounts abruptly closed. So is this a victory for free speech and the beginning of the end of cancel culture? Let's speak to The Spectator's brilliant columnist and the star of Alexandra Marshall Live on ADH TV on YouTube, Alexandra Marshall. Alexandra, good news for Nigel and actually for lots of ordinary people. You know, I'd like to be as optimistic as you, but I'm not completely convinced. I think this was a moment of panic for the Tories and for all Conservative politicians, and they saw this debanking of Nigel Farage and thought, oh, heck, we're going to be out of power soon and the banks will be able to debank all of us and there'll be absolutely nothing we can do about it. Hence the Tory, uh, they were sprung into action, they tried to lean on the banks and the banks had this massive PR campaign against them and they backed down and they've reinstated Nigel Farage. But there is no evidence that either the politicians all the people at Coots, or any other bank for that matter, mm. actually care about free speech. They sat down and they produced all these documents and they colluded to try and find a way to debank not just Farage, but hundreds of other people. They do not value free speech. And I don't think they've actually learned the lesson here about why we should value free speech. All this has taught us is that we have an extremely long way to go in your country and in my country about making these institutions and politicians value free speech rather than running frightened from one social issue to another. Indeed, it's not just banks, is it? Most big corporate institutions have now been infected with woke ideology. It's the ESG scam. They're basically getting rewarded for playing politics with people and their businesses. They're no longer in business in order to make money or to produce good products. They are competing to get this virtue and these donations from these larger organisations to follow political narratives. And that is not a great way to run civilization. I mean, how long is it going to be before we lose cash and then our ability to buy goods and services is going to depend on whether or not those services are deemed to be good or virtuous. I mean, if you buy a steak, you're probably going to get debanked in the next five years. Well, they won't let you have steak, will they? Eventually, it's going to be a plant burger. But listen, Alexandra, I wish we had longer. Last but not least, can you tell me how the attack by Hamas on Israel last weekend is going down in Australia? I think it's exposed an awful lot of naivety, not just from the left, who we always knew were uh, always championing causes that go toward the destruction of our civilization, but there are also people on the right who seem to think if they just hug it out enough, that Islamic terror will let them live. But every single person who has been defending Hamas in the last 48 hours would have been killed at that festival because Hamas terror, like Hezbollah, like ISIS, who have all teamed up together to attack Israel, they're not just interested in attacking Israel. Islamic terror has been spreading terror and murder by the sword for a thousand years. And I think Western countries need to look at what happened at Sydney Opera House, where a thousand people were shouting, gas the Jews, and our police commissioners didn't stop it. Instead, they arrested a man holding an Israeli flag and charged, or they warned him about breaching the peace. This is a disgrace. And I was so embarrassed about what we saw in Australia and how weak our police are, considering 
and you all saw how much strength they had during COVID, where they were throwing little old ladies to the ground and arresting pregnant women. But when it came to Islamic terror, our police ran scared and our politicians ran scared. And I think the West, including Australia, needs to get more serious about this threat, which will come after every peaceful citizen. Well, indeed, uh, Australia and the West uh, have seen their own citizens out on the streets, like those scenes you've just seen there, that footage, uh, celebrating what Hamas have done, this awful terror organisation. Can the genie go back in the bottle, do you think? No, I think what this has become is a watershed moment for mass migration. We've seen with that we've imported third world violent terror onto the streets of the West. It's not just Australia. There have been protests in European countries, including the United Kingdom, and people are shocked to see the hatred and lack of care for the civilization that we've invited people in to the West and said, you know, you can come and live in this, you know, peaceful, free country. And yet what we're seeing is a rebellion against every value and principle that we have fought for and that our great grandparents have fought for. They would be ashamed if they saw those scenes coming out like we saw in the Opera House. What did we spend the last World War fighting for if not to make sure this never happens again? I think it was Brendan O'Neill who wrote in The Spectator last week, what happened to never again? Well, I can tell you what, and, you know, the anti-fascists, where, where's Antifa? I haven't seen Antifa on the streets complaining about genuine fascism and genuine Nazi-style ideology in this Islamic terror. Alexandra, thank you for getting up early to talk to us live from Sydney in Australia, uh, the brilliant columnist Alexandra Marshall. Uh, lots more to come, including tomorrow's papers with full pundit reactions. See you in two. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Open your mouth. OK. Here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Well, it's exactly 10.30, so uh, it's time for tomorrow's front pages. Earlier on GB News Radio. OK, and we start with The Times. And, uh, look, let's get away from Israel for just a moment. Mick Jagger still got it at 80. Isn't it remarkable that he's still one of the biggest stars in the world? He's trim, he's got a full head of hair, all his own teeth. What a legend. Um, however, um, back to what's happening in Israel and Gaza. Disabled teen taken by Hamas. Vulnerable girl among hostages seized by terrorists. A million Gaza residents have been told to flee. Israel stages first raids inside the Gaza Strip. Unable to walk, talk and entirely reliant on her family to feed her through a tube, Ruth Perez travelled to the Supernova Festival near Gaza to communicate through music. She has now been taken by Hamas. The Telegraph, Israel sends in forces as it warns of powerful offensive. First raids into Gaza allow military to strike 750 targets as Palestinians flee amid chaos. Police brace for Palestinian protests as PM vows a hard line on anti-Semitism. The Daily Mail. After giving Palestinians 24 hours to leave their homes, Israel's tanks strike into Gaza. Gaza was tonight braced for an invasion after 1.2 million civilians were told to flee for their lives, write the Mail. Israeli military drones dropped flyers throughout the day today, demanding that Palestinians evacuate the northern half of the Strip within 24 hours or risk being caught in a military escalation. Daily Express now. Jeremy Hunt, no tax cuts. I'm preparing for the worst. And give innocents a chance of life. Archbishop pleads for civilians who cannot bear the cost of terrorists. The fate of 1.1 million civilians trapped in a hellhole Gaza hangs in the balance as Israel prepares to invade and exact its revenge on Hamas terrorists for their atrocities. As it launched the first ground missions to rescue hostages, after warning ordinary Palestinians to evacuate, the Archbishop of Canterbury tonight pleaded that the sins of Hamas are not borne by the citizens of Gaza. It sounds like the Archbishop asking Israel not to retaliate. The Guardian, thousands flee ahead of expected invasion of Gaza. I weekend, no escape. Gazans try to flee, but face Israel's revenge. FT weekend, residents flee Gaza City in fear. And the star, bit of much needed light relief. Balloonatic, sinister clown, terrifying sleepy village, goads bemused police. Catch me if you can. A freaky clown scaring the bejesus out of people in a sleepy village has taunted cops by telling them, catch me if you can. Well, I happen to think... Where Boris Johnson is. This is not... Outrageous. This is really not light relief. I mean, this is terrifying, a clown like that on the loose. Yeah, it is. Have you ever known a clown? That's a horror film. I know, it's called It. Have you never known... Oh, that's the clown and that's from It. They're all sinister. That one's no better, that's just... Yeah. Do you not find all clowns sinister? Yeah, I do. And also, have you ever found a clown funny? No. 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 Not after the clown. <laughs> no. There you go. Terrifying. Again, you know, I've, you been know. That, I've been in that position part. myself from time to time. Um, listen, uh, we've it, got all the papers. There's only one story. That's right. And it's what's happening in Israel. Um, Israel's tanks strike into Gaza. However, uh, Laura, a message from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, give innocent people the chance of life. He pleaded that the sins of Hamas are not borne by the citizens of Gaza. Now, that sounds to me like code to Israel that they should not retaliate. I don't think that they are trying to retaliate on the citizens. I mean, look at the yeah. measures they've put in place. They've done their leaflet drop. They've warned civilians to move out of the way. But, of course, they have to try and root out Hamas. What, what else would they do? Mm. Hamas wants to wipe out the state of Israel mm. and has said before... it. Wants them all dead. What, what, are, what are they point, supposed Lord, to do? Doesn't he? he well, well, I'm not point. saying he doesn't make a point, but no. I don't think the intention of Israel is to visit this on, on to the civilians. I'm afraid well, that's Gaza. It, they're that's they're, what's they're what's doing their best. Happen. Clearly, it is because they've only given these civilians 24 hours to clear mm. their lives. Million needs. people. Where are they going to? They've already dropped bombs in Gaza this week, so. Babies have also died Also, there. I think People... vehicles have been running out of fuel to get away. Like, mm. human basics are water and electricity. They've stopped that. They haven't stopped that for the terrorists. They've stopped that for human 
beings who live in Gaza who are not involved with the terrorism. Indeed. But, I mean, is there a risk of demonising Israel, Jerry, with some of these headlines? Uh, Gazans try to escape but face Israel's revenge. That sounds like very partisan language well, to me. Well, not really. Israel is entitled to revenge. And Israel is entitled to revenge on its enemies who want to destroy not just the state of Israel, mm. but every single Jew. That's the awful thing. These, you see these preachers, they say, every single Jew, man, woman and child must be destroyed. That is a wickedness beyond our belief. Well, in fact, not beyond our belief, because we saw it in the last war. Now, you had a slight disagreement with Stephanie earlier, because mm. we were talking about whether the FA should be shining the colours of the Israeli flag on the Wembley Arch. And Stephanie said it's quite a complicated situation when it's layered. And you said it isn't complicated I, I, I at all. What did it, you I mean? Don't, I, don't, I don't think it's all that complicated. In fact, in many ways, Stephanie and I, I think, agree. And that is, do not equate every Jew of what's happening in Israel. And the Israeli mm -hmm. government has not been a perfect government. Um, we accept that. Uh, do not equate every Palestinian with Hamas. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is the reality. But on the other hand, you've had rockets year after year after mm. year being thrown into uh, Israel, de de mm. destroying life. Mm. There was a real opportunity. This is the Saudi thing. This is what it's all about. It's Iran and Saudis. A real opportunity for peace, a real opportunity to improve the lives of Palestinians. And there's no way the Iranians wanted that to happen. The Iranians are the real enemy. And the West is going to have to decide what to do about it. Indeed. And what about Joe Biden, who has been sending billions to Iran in recent years, since he got into the White House, well, therefore feeding the monster very naive. Mm. Well, there was a stu one thing that President Trump got absolutely right, and it's amazing I'm saying this, but, but actually was the, um, the nuclear deal, which was Obama's deal, which was a complete and utter disaster. You can't trust the Iranians. They are terrorism. Terrorists and their tentacles, you know, they go through all the Middle East. It's... it's they're bad people, and we're going to have to sort out what we're going to do with them. United Nations won't. United Nations haven't actually condemned Hamas. And that's scary. The United Nations? Yeah, uh, that is, uh, that's right. We still, we still await, uh, you know, guidance on that one. Yes. But as you say, there has not been an overt no. condemnation. No. Uh, and, and that's an issue we've had in the last couple of days, is uh, as noticeable silence from so many figures in regards to what has been the worst attack on Jewish people since the Second World War, and, mm. and, and yet silence from so many, Laura. I think worse than silence, as I said at the, at the top of the show, something I found shocking is that people were expressing solidarity with Gaza before Israel had even started retaliating, mm. even while they were still counting the dead in Israel. There's no equivalence to how people treat this. There were a number of professors who were pretty much gloating about what decolonization looks looks like yeah. you know from the safety of their armchair in secure secure countries like the UK and and the US um, students, politicians, journalists I think there's been a real a real bias um, but this is the station of free speech. Mm. They're entitled to say it. We may profoundly disagree with them, but they're entitled to say it. Uh, indeed. So, and, and here's the other question. Is there enough scrutiny, Jerry, of the behaviour of Israel towards Palestine over the last few decades? I think there always has been, but in many ways it's been a little bit biased. I mean, I remember... Uh, this is a slightly light story, but it's true. I met, um, uh, what was it, Shimon Peres. He was president of Israel mm. uh, in the 1980s when he was leader of the opposition. Uh, and he says, Mr Hayes, in Israel we have uh, more firepower from the Arabs than the whole of NATO put together. We have an incompetent government that is not as serious as your poll tax. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there you go. That puts it all in perspective, it puts doesn't in perspective. it? Um, this uh, development there from regarding Saudi Arabia, it's putting US-backed plans to normalise ties with Israel on ice. Uh, two sources familiar with Riyadh's thinking have said, signalling a rapid rethinking 
of its foreign policy priorities as war escalates between Israel and Palestinian group Hamas. And this is a reminder, isn't it, that the implications do not just exist between Israel and Hamas no. and Gaza, but yeah, actually yeah. the whole wider region. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what is going to happen to the Saudi Arabia deal? Mm. None of us know. Because what MBS, you know, he runs effectively runs Saudi Arabia, wants to do, he wants to transform uh, this particular part of the world into a non-oil economy, and he's building massive mm. great things, and he wants free trade with Israel. Now, what's going to happen there? Because the, the, the house of Saud, you know, is in a delicate state. That you, you have to keep the mad extremists on side as well. What's he going to do? That's what the world should be watching at the moment. What is Saudi going to do? And, and it does look, Stephanie, like mm. this is going to go on for years now and that peace is gone for a generation. It has, and I think it's been so sad how quickly this story has developed mm -hmm. and the atrocities that we've all witnessed this week. And as I said earlier on, it feels like ignorance has been bliss towards what Israel has had been doing to Gaza over the past 75 years, the open-air prison that they've had these civilians in. But then also, now it's brought into the limelight, what Hamas is capable of and the revenge that they want to seek on Israel as well. And what is going to happen to the 1.1 million people that is the big who question. lived in Gaza? Are they going to be wel welcomed in Egypt? Because that's the only corridor. Mm. Are they going to be welcomed in Jordan? Are they going to be welcomed elsewhere? Because don't forget, you know, you've got, you've got a problem with Syrian refugees, you've got a problem uh, with people coming into Turkey. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, about 2 million people are going to be displaced. What is Israel going to actually do with Gaza? Mm -hmm. Is it going to raise it to the ground? Is it going to retake it as part of um, Jewish territory? I mean, there are questions here which, wow. And we're Iran, going to have to... Iran, Iran have nuclear weapons it's... and then are backed by Russia. So yes. uh, it's a complex nexus. An axis of evil is how it was described by... by President Reagan. Uh, Reagan and then Bush, of course, yeah. latterly. Um, can Israel wipe out Hamas? No, I don't think they can, because Hamas is are individual people. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you cut off one head of the snake, another one will appear. Wow. You've, the thing is, what is going to happen? What are they going to do to Iran? Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a strike on Iran? Because they're providing the money. That's how you wipe them out. Now, is the West going to allow this to happen? Is Mossad going to do this? Is Israeli Defence Forces? Is the United States going to... Wow, are we going to support that? This is... These, these are big, just, big, big decisions that I, have to be made. I just don't think anyone ever wins when it comes to the war on terrorism. If we look at 9-11, come on, 20 years later, we're still chasing our child, trying to fight terrorism, and it's mm. still popping up in different countries around the world. But is will. Israel surrounded by hostile countries yeah. that mm. contain Hamas and other terrorists who want to wipe out every Jew and destroy the state of Israel? So what is Israel supposed to do? Well, yes, how much of a fight for Israel is a fight for the West? Mm and for a fight for freedom. That's an interesting The, the only democracy in the region, Laura. I think, you know, it, the way we're talking about this is nothing like the way people talked about Russia and Ukraine, where mm. they wanted Russians to denounce Putin, mm. um, where everyone saw Ukraine's fight as a fight for Western democracy. Mm. And we're not applying the same equivalents. And I, th I think we should be. It reminds me of the Martin Niemöller poem. Mm. First they came for the socialists. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think we should be giving every support to Israel. Yeah, of course. But that's how? Amazing. That's the but problem. How? That's the million dollar question. Well, look, uh, we've got more papers coming up, of course, more from what's happening in Israel and Gaza. We've got more live pictures to come from Gaza City. At the moment, a dark night sky, uh, but that will likely change in the hours ahead. Uh, but the sun and the mirror waiting in the wings. Plus, my pundits will be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros. And what will no doubt be a tonal gear shift, Laura Dodsworth, my excellent pundit, wants to talk about Viagra. Find out why next. Who is it? We're here for the show. More energy this time! 
Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. Bellissima. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday, the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus, on the smart speaker app, and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. OK, more papers are in, courtesy of Lottie. Thanks to uh, her for bringing them in. And we've got uh, the Sun and the Mirror. Where should we start? We've got the Sun newspaper here. Top Gear exclusive, £9 million BBC Freddy payout. Andrew Freddy Flintoff has agreed a £9 million settlement with the BBC over his Top Gear smash. The Ashes cricket hero negotiated a payout understood to be for two years' loss of earnings after suffering life-altering injuries. BBC Studios tonight said it had sincerely apologised to Freddie. Also, Israel's SAS in raid on Gaza is the other story in the sun. Uh, mirror now, Middle East tensions rise, cops on high terror alert. UK attack fears as protests planned against Gaza siege. A million told to flee as Israeli troops move in. Uh, Stephanie, a quick word on... Andrew Freddie Flintoff. I've worked with him. He's a real gentleman. Mm. He had the most horrific car crash whilst filming Top Gear. He wasn't actually driving that quickly. I think it no, was like an open-top yeah. Morgan car, yeah. but it, it flipped yeah. and he wasn't wearing a and helmet. And the impact of it. And mm. he only just came out recently, Mark, to say that he's been through the most traumatic and hardest year of his life, which is totally understandable. You know, when you do a show like Top Gear, you do it for the love of speed and the love of those kind of dangerous stunts, but yeah. this is a stunt which went badly yeah. and potentially could be calling the end of Top Gear as a show and yeah. as a brand. Indeed so. And is there a way back for Freddie? I guess it depends on his health. I think his worth now is going to have to change now. I can't mm -hmm. see him doing presenting high dangerous shows such as Top Gear. I think, yeah. you know, he's going to have to psychologically 
get through this and hopefully there is a room for him to do more presenting, but just not in this line of work. Duty of care. No one's mentioned duty of care. Do you remember yeah. Richard Hammond? Yeah. He nearly died. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in a rocket car. In a rocket mm -hmm. car, yeah. Well, that's why they're calling to cancel Top Gear, because you can't bring back the show and make it a lightweight version of what it was. But you should the have reason, a duty of care. The reason why people watch it is because they love watching these stunts. Yeah. Yeah, they do indeed. Well, we wish Freddie a speedy mm. recovery. He really is a lovely guy and it was a devastating accident. And I think we'll, we'll all miss Top Gear, which is a classic bit of TV from The Beeb. Um, listen, let's, uh, let's get on to a rather more adult subject because writing in the Telegraph newspaper, journalist Petronella Wyatt reveals that last year, the over 70s received a record 282,000 prescriptions <laughs> for Viagra, a small blue pill which helps men perform in the bedroom. I think Jerry's just popped a couple. No, I haven't. I didn't realise I didn't realise you had to take them orally. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. 7,000 of these blue pills went to men over 90, the eldest patient being 99. Cool. But Petronella Wyatt suggests it's a disaster for society and is turning Britain into a nation of dirty old men. She calls for Viagra to be banned. Is she right or just an ageist spoil sport? L Laura. I think she's an ageist spoil sport. Look, it's um, you've got to remember Viagra isn't actually really just for men in their 70s, 80s, 90s. The average age is 50, uh, 53, I think. Um, I'm not so worried about the ones that are given on prescription. You have to remember that older men have a bit of trouble in that department, and if they can if they can keep it going, not it helps caring. them have loving, enjoyable sexual <laughs> relationships. And I say good on them. Yes, uh, I mean was, Petronella yeah. says in that article, old people are too ugly to have sex. Oh, and I think she does well, basically. She knows. She knows. Oh, and I think that's mean. You know, I think that you, when you're oh. in when you're in love, it's not what you look like, it's what you feel yeah, like. Yes. And if people are still having sex when they're that's great. I tell you what would really worry me about Viagra, and, and what is a much more serious problem than old men taking it, and it's Young men. So um, before my estate of fear days, I uh, produced three photography books about the body, and the middle one was called Manhood. I f photographed and interviewed 100 men about their manhood and their manhood. And there were quite a lot of Viagra discussions. And a trend that's actually started with Viagra is that young men are taking it like a lifestyle drug. Oh dear. So the problem is that rather than it being a physiological reason, it's psychological. Mm -hmm. So if they've got an issue about performance in the bedroom, they're having it as a prophylactic, but the other way round, in order to feel confident that they're going to be able to do the business. God, no. But also there are a lot of young men who've become addicted to porn and they get yeah. erectile dysfunction issues and so they need Viagra just to have a normal sexual relationship. Blimey. And so it's not the prescriptions to older men we should be worried about. I say good on them, especially the men who've had prostate cancer, who've got low testosterone sure. and, yeah. and it's given them a lease of life. It's the young men, the young men who shouldn't be taking Using it because it they don't a have a yeah. recreational yeah. drug or a crutch. Yeah, I saw, Basically, yeah. I, yeah. Saw, I saw a great sign in a, in a cafe the other day. It says, Viagra doesn't make you James Bond, but it makes you Roger Moore. You've been fine and upstanding tonight, Jerry. Oh, yes. uh, we've only got a few seconds. Oh, yeah. Back to Jerry. Yes, um, yeah. uh, can we just power through your headline heroes and back page oh, God, zero? So, Stephanie, enough. briefly, if you can, a few seconds for My your hero. My headline hero is Colleen Rooney because I can't wait for her Wagga for docu documentary to come out where she will give her side of events. So, I'm very happy. Team you said, you nearly said documentary. Oh, oh briefly, your headline hero. Please. Yeah. Um, my hero are all the. Um, Israeli heroes and heroines. The one I'd like to particularly pick, unfortunately, I've just her, her name's just been wiped from my head. But she was a young woman at a kibbutz. In Bar Lieberman. Thank you so much, who basically saved her whole kibbutz yes. by getting other people on the kibbutz yeah. uh, tooled up and they managed to kill every terrorist and they oh, saved the kibbutz. It's amazing. Just Amazing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, briefly, your headline hero? Jake Wallace Simmons. You've oh, never absolutely. heard of him. But well, what do you, what do you him. have? Uh, he's the uh, editor of the Jewish Chronicle mm. and he was on BBC Question Time. And with great grace and decency and authority, he put the case, not for Israel, but for the Jews. Name only for your zeros, your zero. Jada Pinkett Smith. Oh, go on then, sentence why? <laughs> because she finished her husband's career, now she says they've been separated since 2016. Will Smith, she's a terrible woman. Yeah. Go on. F.A. You don't need any more words from me. BBC, I'm afraid. Who don't know the word oh, terrorist. No. I'm sure that Jada Pinkett Smith would defend her admission that she's been separated from Will Smith for a long time, and I'm sure she's a lovely lady. 
Everything we've said is in jest. Listen, thank you so much <laughs> for a really, really busy show and a tough show to do. Well done to the team, uh, <laughs> Melissa, Greg and Lottie. We're back tomorrow at nine. Headliners is next. Good evening. It's turning colder out there. A much chillier weekend ahead. There'll be some autumn sunshine and a few showers, particularly so tomorrow. We've seen some fairly wet weather today from this area of low pressure. That is starting to pull away, but behind it, we've got the colder air, and that will be very noticeable for all of us through the weekend. Still some pretty heavy downpours, though, across the extreme southeast for a time this evening before that clears away. And then we'll have showers keeping going for Northern Ireland and Northern Scotland. Getting very windy tonight across Northern Scotland and especially so through Shetland. Uh, a very blustery night here. Elsewhere, it will be the cold, you notice, with temperatures well down into single figures. A much colder night in the south compared to recent nights. But there should be quite a bit of sunshine around on Saturday morning for southern Scotland, eastern and southern England. Some showers for Wales, northwest England and northern Ireland. And we'll keep some showers going across the west coast of Scotland and in northern Scotland, where the winds will only slowly ease and the showers will fall as snow over the hills as temperatures struggle in the single digits. Further south, we might squeak into the teens, but everywhere feeling colder. And a cold start to Sunday with a greater chance of a touch of frost, certainly from northern England northwards. Again, though, many places having a, a sparkling start with some good spells of sunshine, a few scattered showers for Wales and a few for northern Scotland. But generally Sunday looking dry for many and bright. And after we start close to freezing, we struggle up to 11 or 12 Celsius. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs.